I, I love this period in our history because it's the only time in my life where people say to me, unmute yourself. Uh, so now that I'm unmuted, I can introduce our uh, event. Welcome to the Brookings Institution and our event on what was a very exciting election and continues to be. But I'd like to underscore at the very beginning, it's exciting, but it's perfectly normal. Uh, the vote counting that is going on in states around the country uh, is the kind of vote counting that happens in every election. Um, if there is a difference, it's because millions more people voted uh, by mail in this election uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, in a couple of states like Pennsylvania, state legislatures declined to uh, reform their laws so ballots could be prepared earlier. So it's taking longer to count the ballots in Pennsylvania uh, than it is in other states. And the kinds of leads candidates enjoy uh, uh, in uh, some of the states are no closer than leads we've seen in many elections. Um, at the moment, uh, Joe Biden is ahead of uh, Donald Trump by margins equal to or greater than the margins Trump won by in uh, Michigan and Wisconsin. Um, uh, Biden does have a small margin uh, in Nevada where they are still counting votes. Um, one other fact about the election I think is, is worth underscoring is as of this moment, uh, Biden uh, either has secured or leads in states with exactly 270 electoral votes. Uh, and with the states of Pennsylvania and Georgia in particular, uh, still very much in play. My colleague, Elaine Kmark, will tell us much more about that. But I think it's just important in this climate, especially given some of the things the president said uh, last night, uh, to underscore again, this is normal democracy and vote counting. Uh, I've got an awesome panel of colleagues here. By the way, I, my name is E.J. Dion. Uh, I'm, as you can see on your little screen, I'm a senior fellow um, at the Brookings Institution. I'm really honored to be joined by a group of extraordinary co uh, colleagues. I also want to thank everyone uh, who has sent questions in um, in advance, and we're going to try to answer a lot of those uh, for example, there is uh, an excellent series of questions on youth voting and what young people uh, did and might do after this election. Camille uh, wants to take those on. There are other questions about the Senate and House races that Molly will take on. Um, we are probably not going to answer the questions on what would a Joe Biden administration look like or what will they do uh, in foreign policy, uh, because we think it probably makes the most sense uh, to uh, have this election finally decided, which we probably will have to wait a day or two uh, for. Um, but um, uh, the other thing I want to say is you can submit your own questions um, two ways, um, either to events at brookings.edu um, or on Twitter. Uh, the hashtag is hashtag election 2020, all one word. And those questions are going to filter back to me, and uh, I'm gonna to try to use as many of them as I can as the event uh, goes forward because the smart people out there may well think of better questions than I will. So I wanna thank you for your participation. Um, so let me briefly introduce Camille Bassett, a senior fellow in governance studies uh, with affiliated appointments in our economic studies and metropolitan studies programs. Uh, she is director of the Race, Prosperity and Inclusion Initiative a Brookings cross program uh, uh, initiative focused on issues of equity, racial justice and economic mobility um, for low income communities and communities of color. Um, and her work is focused on, on systematic racism, economic advancement of black and Native American boys, the importance of social relationship to economic mobility and equity in healthcare and local and state government policy priorities. You can tell she's been very busy in this period of the pandemic. Uh, welcome, Camille. Um, Thanks, I, want to, uh, I want to introduce next in alphabetical order, my colleague, John Udak, the deputy director of the Center for Effective Public Management, a senior fellow in governance studies. Uh, his research uh, examines questions of presidential power in the context of administration, personnel, and public policy. He focuses on campaigns and elections legislative uh, executive intersection and state and federal marijuana policy. 
Uh, this is the place to be if you want to find out where all of those, what happened in all of those marijuana uh, referenda that were on the ballot around the country um, uh, uh, yesterday. Um, and um, uh, he, he and then and he is just awesome on electoral politics and polling, which is one of the things he'll discuss. Elaine K. Mark is a senior fellow in the Governance Studies Program, as well as director of the Center for Effective Public Management. She's an expert on American electoral politics, government innovation in reform uh, and reform in the U.S., but also in OECD nations and developing countries. She is the author of Primary Politics, Everything You Need to Know About How America Nominates Its Presidential Candidates. And she is also a lecturer at the, in public policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Finally, but in no means fi uh, least, um, our dear colleague Molly Reynolds, a senior fellow in governance studies. She studies Congress, uh, which is very useful for us today uh, in particular. Um, with an emphasis on how congressional rules and procedures affect domestic policy outcomes. Uh, she is the author of the book, Exceptions to the Rule, the Politics of Filibuster Limitations uh, in the U.S. Senate, um, which may or may not become relevant soon, um, and the consequences of the budget reconciliation process and other uh, procedures in the U.S. Senate. Um, and she also supervises uh, the maintenance of a wonderful Brookings uh, used to be book. Now, I think it's mostly online. Uh, that, if I remember right, was started by our colleague Tom Mann and also Norm Ornstein over at uh, the American Enterprise Institute, Vital Statistics on Congress. So let me begin by turning to Elaine. I laid out the sort of very raw uh, data on the results of this election. Tell us what's happening and what we are likely to see over the next uh, couple of days. Uh, mute, unmute yourself. You're muted, Elaine? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> All right. Thank you, EJ, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this Brookings webinar. Um, this is a very, very tight race, and the count is taking a very long time, but we knew that would happen. We knew that the combination of an extraordinary number of absentee and early votes plus a very, very tight race would mean a long count. And I think as Americans, we all want this count to be as careful and as deliberate as possibly can be. Um, given that, we are down to a handful of states. And some. let me just talk about some of them and give you an, a sense of what's happening in each one. Um, in Nevada, Biden has a very, very narrow lead. Um, and they have announced that they're not gonna count any more votes until Thursday at noon. Uh, and they'll announce them Thursday at noon. They're not making any more announcements. Um, what is giving Democrats hope in Nevada is the fact that Clark County, which is home to Las Vegas and Reno, uh, the two population centers of, other, of an otherwise very rural state, um, those, a lot of those ballots have not been counted yet. So Democrats are hoping that the 0.6% uh, margin that Biden now enjoys will in, get bigger. Um, in Arizona, which some networks have already called for Biden, there is a 3.4% lead by Biden. 86% uh, of the vote is in, but Maricopa County, which is Phoenix, which is the uh, population center of that state, and which is also very democratic, uh, that is still, Phoenix is still counting votes. So that could actually get bigger. Wisconsin has almost all the votes in, and there the Biden lead looks to be 0.6%, same as in Nevada, ironically. Um, and it looks like they may be headed for an automatic recount. Um, Trump has already stated that he wants a recount there. And given how extraordinarily close that is, that's probably uh, fine. This election could come down to Wisconsin. Um, and finally, in Michigan, um, and I'm going to talk about Michigan and Pennsylvania. Michigan, again, Biden has a very narrow lead, under 1%. 94% of the vote is in. However, in Wayne County, which is Detroit, which is a heavily Democratic vote, um, only 81% of the vote is in. And in Grand Rapids, another Democratic center in the state, 
um, only 85% of the vote is in. So Biden runs a chance of exceeding that one, that 0.9% if when those counties come in. Um, the reason I gave you those four first is that at this moment, the Biden campaign is saying they've got 270 electoral college votes and they've got it. If they get those four states um, and nothing untoward happens in the other states that, that they've got it. That means, interestingly enough, that they don't need to win. Biden doesn't need to win Pennsylvania, may not need to win Pennsylvania. And that may be a good thing because frankly, Trump has a very large lead in Pennsylvania, a lot large. I mean, the polls were just way off on Pennsylvania. The po polls were showing an average of a five point lead in Pennsylvania. Trump's lead is 8.1% right now. However, again, only 19 of Pennsylvania's 67 counties have reported their absentee ballots. If you'll remember, Pennsylvania, like Wisconsin, is one of those states where the state legis the Republican state legislature said, nope, can't count the absentee ballots before election day. So they just started counting on election day. And that's, you know, that's a huge, huge number of votes in Pennsylvania. Um, among the counties that where they need to count the absentee ballots are Philadelphia and Allegheny County, which is, which is the city of Pittsburgh. Both of those population centers are places where uh, Biden has been leading in the polling. And if you combine the votes that are out from there, plus the fact that most of these um, absentee ballots um, we've been seeing have tended to lean Democratic, it's possible that Pennsylvania will um, fall into the Democratic column, but that, that's a stretch. So, you know, right now we are looking at an, an exquisitely narrow race. I mean, maybe we have a 270 to 2, 268 um, uh, result here, which is practically a tie in the Electoral College, although not, not a tie. And a lot of this, um, my final comment will be, that a lot of a lot of what we saw last night and the the anxiety and the drama has to do with this dramatically new way of voting. If you were a Democrat last night and you tuned in right at seven o'clock, you were really excited because guess what? Florida was blue, North Carolina was blue, and Ohio was blue. Well, that's because they counted their absentee ballots early. So the Democratic vote came in first. What we're seeing in other states, of course, is that there, as the that the states that came in where the ballots or the absentee ballots are coming later, they are read initially by big margins, and then the margins are shrinking as the absentee ballots come in. So um, the bad news is we're going to have to wait a couple of days to really see what this picture is. Uh, the good news is that states seem to be taking their time doing this carefully. And if you, just a reminder to everybody out there, when these votes are counted in the room, there is a representative of the Republican party and a representative of the Democratic party. They are watching every single count all across the country. And of course, they're, both parties are armed with lawyers ready to go right to court um, if they think something untoward is happening. So there's a lot of transparency to this process. And um, we are just gonna have to wait a couple days to see where where it ends up. Could I just ask a quick follow-up? Um, the Biden campaign argues that in fact, uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, there really are a whole lot of outstanding ballots from Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. And they are speaking, and, and I don't think it's put on, although we'll find out, uh, with a fair amount of confidence that they can actually overcome this uh, margin. And then there's also talk that a lot of ballots are missing, haven't been counted yet, not missing, just there are a lot of uncounted ballots in Fulton and DeKalb counties, uh, Atlanta and the suburb, suburbs that are Democratic. Um, and so Georgia still seems in play. Could you just deal with that one yeah. last uh, sort of moving piece here? Yeah, um, Georgia is already at 93% of the vote counted. OK, so the missing ballot and, and that's true that Atlanta or Fulton County and DeKalb County um, 
where Biden is strong um, aren't all in. DeKalb County, um, Biden is winning um, at and but it's only 85% in. So there's a possibility there. Um, I I wouldn't necessarily count on Georgia, frankly, um, just given given the history of it, given um, the the results in the Senate races, which I know Molly will talk about. I, I wouldn't talk about, I wouldn't really put Georgia in the bank yet. Pennsylvania is a very interesting question. Um, you know, it's, it's a state that's got Philly and Pittsburgh, and the joke is that Pennsylvania is Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Alabama in the middle. And that big middle swath of the state is extraordinarily conservative um, on just all sorts of questions, including race, which is why they call it Alabama in the middle. Those, those counties, as I was watching last night, and I know a little bit about Philadelphia, was there on, about Pennsylvania, was there on election day. Um, those rural counties were coming in with huge Trump margins. I mean, they were just, even though they're small counties, not a lot of voters, they were coming in 71, 72, 75% Trump. So there has to be an awful lot of votes in Philly and Pittsburgh to make up this 8% gap we're seeing now. Um, and I know that the Biden campaign is, you know, enthusiastic about it and thinks they're eventually going to win Pennsylvania, but I wouldn't be as sure of that as I am, say, of Michigan. Thank you. Um, John Udak, you have spent a lot of time with the exit polls. And as we talked about this before, exit polls were particularly vexed this year since an awful lot of po people were not there to exit a polling place because they didn't uh, vote at a polling place. But there have been some adjustments where uh, by combining uh, uh, methods uh, there was one produced, and John, you've uh, uh, taken a look at it very carefully, and uh, we would, uh, I'm sure everybody out there would be interested in what you have found about what we all did yesterday. Uh, sure, thanks, EJ. Or what we all did, actually, for the last month. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, EJ, and I just want to reiterate um, your comments uh, at the top that it's frustrating that we don't know um, whether President Trump is being reelected or whether Joe Biden has won, and that should not signal to anyone that the process isn't working. It is a signal that the process is working, that these votes are being counted. And again, while it's frustrating, uh, the alternative of, of this being a sham process is, is much worse than frustrating. I think we should be happy the care that election um, uh, officials are taking in a lot of states, really in every state, but especially in these key states over the, uh, the coming days. So the exit polls uh, told uh, really two sort of different stories, two sort of competing stories, uh, compare, particularly compared to 2016. In some ways, this was a repeat of what we saw in 2016. A lot of the demographics looked fairly similar in terms of turnout. Um, given that exit polls, of course, also have a margin of error, you know, a one or two percent difference from in between now and 2016 uh, really is indistinguishable. And so uh, when you look at, for instance, uh, uh, women turned out they were 53 percent of the electorate in 2016. They were 53 percent of the electorate in 2020. In 2016, Clinton won women by a margin of 13 points. Uh, in 2020, Biden won women by a margin of 13 points. Um, there are a lot of consistencies between uh, the two years. Uh, there are a couple of differences, though. So um, again, a couple of points here and there. Um, it, it's hard to it's hard to distinguish, but it, it suggested that the electorate was a little bit older uh, this year than it was in 2016. Uh, in 2016, 44 percent of the turnout came from people under the age of 45. Uh, that number was 41 percent in 2020. Um, uh, in 2016, 50% of the electorate um, held a college degree, 50% did not. Last night, 56% of the electorate did not hold a college degree. Um, and so that would suggest a sort of benefit for Trump. We all always hear about the white working class voters and uh, the benefits that they uh, were able to deliver to President Trump, but uh, the Trump margin evaporated uh, among individuals without a college degree. So in 2016, uh, uh, individuals without a college degree, Trump won them by seven points. Um, it was a tie last night. Um, the, there was, uh, it was 49-49 for, for Biden and Trump. Uh, those are some interesting numbers. Uh, it also showed uh, that there is a, 
um, a, a continuing trend. Our colleague Bill Fry has written about this uh, pretty significantly. I know Camille is going to talk a little bit about this too. Um, the electorate was less white um, last night than it was in 2016. In 2016, 71% um, of the electorate was white. Last night, that was 65%. That is a trend that we are going to continue to see. Bill Fry's work um, shows us um, just how diverse America is getting, how diverse the electorate is getting, and that has significant effects. And so that this was a close race um, is not surprising when we look at the exit polls because 2016 was a close race. And if we see these differences as fairly minimal in terms of what the electorate looked like, um, it's not a surprise that this is going to be a, a maybe a small win for Joe Biden, maybe a small win uh, for Donald Trump. But just like in 2016, um, where President Trump won the election because of 78,000 votes spread across Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, it looks like the victor is going to come down, as Elaine said, to just a couple of states and probably razor thin margins um, in a couple of those states. Um, now, that said, there were some pretty significant changes last night when we look at what happened. Um, Biden, uh, as Elaine said, some of the polls, uh, some of the outlets rather, have called Arizona for Biden. I'm pretty sure Biden is going to win Arizona. That's a, a historic change, a change that a lot of us saw, of, of us saw coming over time, um, but, but a change nonetheless. Uh, the uh, narrowing of the Republican advantage in states like Georgia um, is also a trend that we're going to be looking at. Stacey Abrams run for governor um, in razor thin loss uh, two years ago, I think uh, foretold uh, that, that this was happening in Georgia. And it looks like uh, President Trump will probably win Georgia by, by a hair, um, but Biden might because of DeKalb County and, and Fulton County might be able to eke out a win. Uh, but if you rewind four years ago or eight years ago, we weren't talking about this in Georgia. We weren't having this kind of conversation with Georgia. And it does suggest that there are these changes um, in the electorate in some states that um, perhaps don't change things in 2020, but maybe they do change things in 2024, states like Texas as well. Um, I think that's going to be a big part of the conversation. And so that the electorate didn't look all that different from 2020, I think might be um, an interesting story. Uh, but I also think that we are looking at a razor thin election um, fits pretty neatly in with President Trump's political strategy over his four years in office so far um, and during his campaign. And that was not to expand his uh, his opportunities not to try um, doing new things or appealing to different voters in different ways. It was a very pure base campaign to connect with the people who voted for him in 2016, which if you're Barack Obama in 2008 and you try to do, or in 2012 rather, and try to connect with your voters from 2008, that's a hell of a lot of voters to connect to and you have a very comfortable margin. But when you've won by such a narrow margin, not trying to expand your appeal means one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to lose um, or you're going to win by a razor thin margin. And I think that's where we're at right now. This the, America is deeply divided. And I think the campaigns that were run um, ended up appealing to a lot of the same voters um, who were want, uh, who each campaign won in 2016. Uh, yeah, could I just point out one thing, um, which is uh, Joe Biden at the moment, as of this very moment, has 69,941,000 votes. He's easily going to tip over into 70 million. Joe Biden will get more votes than any presidential candidate in our history. His popular vote margin, you're quite right, John, about razor thin in a number of states. Um, his uh, uh, popular vote margin is, is nationally over two points. It's Right now, it's 3 million votes. And given how many votes are out in California and urban areas, it's very likely that Joe Biden's popular vote margin will be up around 5 or 6 million uh, by the time this is all over, maybe more. And I, I just, uh, obviously, those of us who are interested in reforming the Electoral College can't resist noting that. But I also think it's important optic for uh, to see the election in and not simply focus on razor thin margins in the states. Would you dissent from that in any way? No, I, I agree. And I, I think the conversation um, in the national popular vote campaign and in other um, organizations that are looking to get rid of the Electoral College, this is going to be one more example of why that reform would drastically change 
uh, electoral politics in the United States. And it's also um, important to note, uh, you know, there's a lot we don't know about how this race is going to turn out. But you're right, EJ, we do know that Joe Biden will win the popular vote. That, that is a, cert a certainty at this point. And so that means since 1992, Republicans have won the popular vote in the United States once in 2004. And I was uh, talking to Elaine uh, last week and I said, what that means is we are going to have voters voting on election day in 2024 who have not been alive during a time when Republicans won the popular vote in the United States. 18 and 19 year olds will have been born in 2005 and 2006. And that's a fairly remarkable um, situation in electoral politics, particularly when you rewind back from 1992 and you look at significant popular vote wins uh, during the Bush and Reagan years, um, that is a drastic transformation in our politics. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to, Camille wanted to take on a number of questions, including, by the way, uh, some of the very questions that came in before the event uh, from many of our thoughtful um, our thoughtful participants. Uh, I'll read a couple of those and then go um, uh, go to the other issues you want to take on. Uh, is there any indication that new and first time voters will remain active beyond this election or the election? Uh, will the younger voters begin to have more political voice and power? Um, how are young people being given a voice outside the general election? How can we empower our youth? Uh, to be a voice. And uh, Camille, uh, there was real racial polarization in this election. There were important developments um, in the Latino vote. We were talking before about looking at how different uh, the Latino vote was in, for example, Maricopa County, uh, Arizona, and Miami-Dade County in Florida. Uh, please take on this whole panoply of questions, including the ones uh, from our thoughtful uh, viewers. I'm just asking you to deal with everything. <laughs> okay, well, well, great. No, no worries there. Um, <laughs> like my colleagues before that, I will do my best. Um, but first of all, I just want to uh, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us, and thanks, EJ, for um, teeing up uh, the, you know the area that I'm going to deal with. Um, I just want to start by saying that this morning, the Süddeutsche Zeitung, which is a, um, a paper, a large paper in, in uh, southern Germany, started off by saying that American democracy is kaput. And um, I just want to join my colleagues in saying what we've seen here uh, last night and over the last month has been an extraordinary exercise in democracy. And I think um, in many, many ways uh, makes it very clear that democracy in the U.S. is pretty healthy. Um, and uh, the care, the caution uh, with which uh, what votes are now being ca um, counted, I think also, again, underscores um, the health of our democracy. So um, I think it's, uh, we are in, a, we're actually in a really good place from a perspective of, you know, having a really well functioning democracy and having incredible turnout. So um, kudos to all my uh, fellow Americans for, for really participating. Uh, what I wanted to talk about um, in my segment really was um, some of these different ethnic blo uh, voting blocks. And I wanted to start by saying that what I thought I saw in the exit polls and also in the, in the um, votes as they're being counted is that there were actually two countervailing trends here um, that probably explain some of what we're seeing and how, and, and how tight um, these margins are in particular states. So the first is, you know, as uh, John had mentioned, you know, the demographics in the United States are clearly shifting. You have um, a smaller percentage of the um, voting public is white and a larger percentage are people of color. Um, and that is kind of an inex inescapable sort of um, direction in which we're moving. And the other, uh, so the, and the other sort of trend or countervailing kind of um, uh, a pattern I saw is that this is really, there was really a lot about race and racism in this particular election. And I think those are actually a little bit, those two trends I think can help explain some of the differences that we saw in the tightness of these elections. So let me talk about that a little bit. Um, I wanna talk about, uh, first of all, Latino votes, right? And we always think about the Latino vote and I want us to be pretty cautious about um, saying that as we move forward. There are so many different Latino uh, constituencies with very different histories of insertion in the US, 
um, and, and different sort of cultural references, et cetera, different racial um, identities. So I think it's really, uh, you know, we use it as a, as a shorthand, but I think it's really important, particularly as you look through some of these electoral results to, to really differentiate between the different kinds of election votes. I'm gonna do that here. Um, use it as an example, Maricopa County in Arizona and Miami-Dade in Florida. So in Maricopa County, um, you have uh, an increasingly large Latino electorate. Um, most of those folks are uh, have some, um, uh, their heritage is, is Mexican, largely Mexican. So they, you know, they may be several generations away from Mexico, or they may be very recently arrived. Um, but that is largely a Mexican American constituency. Um, in within that constituency, what we saw is that a lot of young people got really, really activated in Maricopa County. A lot of young Latinos got very, very activated there, and that actually that pattern actually started. Um, in, 20, uh, in the 2018 cycle, um, the Democratic Party put some uh, resources in, into the, the you know, Latino, uh, young Latino vote, voters in Maricopa County, and that has paid off pretty handsomely. So what you see when you look at the issue areas that Latinos voted on in Maricopa County, they were primarily concerned with COVID, um, the economy, uh, and jobs. That, that, those are the things that they were most concerned with. Um, if you now move over to Miami-Dade, where Biden really underperformed Hillary Clinton. So Hillary Clinton did pretty well in Miami-Dade, particularly among Latinos in 2016. That is not true for Biden. Biden still carried Miami-Dade, but it was really, really much thinner margin than, uh, than Hillary Clinton had enjoyed. And the reason for that actually is a depression in the Latino vote for Biden. So what does that Latino vote for Biden look, uh, Latino vote look like in Miami-Dade? Well, that is primarily you know, the Cuban American base. And Cuban Americans historically have been much more Republican, but I think what came, uh, what really um, emerged in this election is that Cuban Americans have a very uh, organized machine in Miami-Dade. Um, they, they hold a lot of electoral offices. They have a lot of resources for pulling out the vote. And in terms of issue areas, the key issue areas for them uh, among the top three issue areas were the economy and violent crime. So when you think about, you hear the term violent crime, it's the, it, you're talking about this whole uh, set of issues around law and order, which is really code for um, you know, uh, making sure that People of color um, are uh, continue to be um, uh, supervised. Let me put it that way by law enforcement entities. And so, what's interesting about the Cuban American vote is that it's mostly white. So, Cuban Americans, who particularly who have a history of having come over here uh, just you know pre Castro or immediately post Castro, were from the elite in Cuba. Cuba has a lot of Black Cubans but those black Cubans mostly stayed in Cuba. So the people we have here are people who are um, re, you know, they're sort of re-emphasizing that, uh, that kind of racial split that you had in Cuba that allowed them to do well in Cuba, allowed them to come over here and make new lives for themselves. And so when Trump talked about law and order, um, that actually had a lot of resonance for Cuban Americans who largely here are white and do not see themselves as having anything in common with other Latinos, particularly Latinos who have, uh, you know, or have African heritage or some part of their, their heritage is African. So those are very distinct votes. The Mexican American vote in, uh, in Maricopa County, which is not, you know, um, which when we talk about racial issues actually is much more concerned with how different types of people are treated in the US, that turned out to be an important issue for them as well. But when we come back to Miami-Dade, we we're talking about Cuban Americans, particularly white Cuban Americans, which make up 97% of the Latino vote in Miami-Dade, you are talking about racial politics. So there I think, you know, there's racial politics and then there's demographics. And I think those two combine to give some pretty interesting results in Latino communities. I also want to talk a little bit about um, black voters. So there was a lot of chatter uh, before the election about how 
uh, Trump was trying to pick off um, black men. Uh, and um, we had a number of you know, rappers and other kinds of personalities, sports figures coming out um, to say uh, you know, that they endorsed Trump. It turns out when you look at exit polls and other kinds of polls that black men actually went for Trump at, at 82% um, of black men went for, for Trump and for black wait, women. Wait, 82% went for Trump? Oh, no, sorry, for Biden, sorry. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. that's- yeah. Right. yeah, I misspoke. <laughs> 82% went for Biden. Thank you for correcting me. 82% went for <laughs> Biden and 91% of black women went for Biden. So, you know, there's that, that narrative around Trump really peeling off black men, it turns out that, that that didn't actually happen. And so blacks pretty much went for Biden and that's, you see that throughout a variety of different polls and results. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is young people. So this is an election where we had a very, um, uh, very, very strong turnout from people who were in that sort of 18 to 30 age range. Um, and part of that is people were galvanized by the racial justice politics. Part of it is people were, were gal galvanized by some of the economic issues that were coming out. But we saw a lot of really good participation from young people. And now the question is, how do each of these parties, both Democrats and, um, and Republicans, continue to energize young people as we move forward? And I would, you know, I'd venture to say that actually, for the Republicans, it's gonna be a little bit more of a, um, a taller order for them because they haven't actually reached out in quite the same way the Democrats have in activating particularly around um, you know, Black Lives Matter and other kinds of social justice issues. So that remains to be very, uh, to be seen, but I think that's a very interesting um, com component of where the vote was this time and what it portends for, um, for 2024. Thank you for handling so many questions for us. Um, I just want to, on the uh, Cuban Americans in particular, um, uh, if anyone wondered why did Donald Trump keep saying that Joe Biden was going to be a secret socialist, uh, that was also a clear appeal to a community that had escaped a communist regime. And I think that Absolutely. Made some impact among conservative uh, Latinos from various, who have immigrated from various places, although I'm not sure it did not seem to have that same power with Mexican Americans, although there's evidence that South Texas also did not turn out for Biden the way they had hoped. But that, so I think we're going to be talking about the Latino vote a lot in the next uh, four years. But thank you for that, Molly. You know everything about Congress. So what happened? Um, it appears that the Republicans are going to hold on to the Senate, although maybe we'll have some runoffs uh, in Georgia. Tell us what happened. Uh, uh, on Tuesday and why and what it portends for uh, governing. Sure, thanks, EJ. Um, I certainly don't know everything about Congress, but I have some thoughts on what happened um, yesterday, what's likely to happen um, in the next couple of weeks um, and going into, um, into 2021. So I thought I'd start by talking about the House, then talk a little bit about the Senate. So I think it's safe to say that what we saw uh, yesterday and as the um, results continue to be tabulated, as my um, colleagues have indicated, um, the uh, just as the continuing uh, tabulation of results in the presidential race is completely normal, the continued tabulation of results in congressional races is also completely normal. I'd point folks back to 2018 when um, in California, for example, it took several weeks before a number of house races were finalized. So this kind of slow um, methodical tabulating of ballots again is what we, uh, is not unusual for congressional races either. But having said that, um, we did see uh, an unexpectedly weak performance for House Democrats yesterday. Going into um, election day, the kind of um, uh, rhetoric that you were hearing was that a, a bad night for House Democrats would be if they only picked up five seats um, and that there was, a, there was expectation they would pick up say 10 or 15. And it, uh, as a, at the moment, it looks um, like they stand to, um, to actually lose some seats. Um, and several of these losses um, were in districts. Um, did you say lose some, some seats? Did you put a number? Did you put I, a number? I did on not that put a number just... um, on it at this point oh, okay. um, because the the situation is um, is that they'll still hold the majority, um, but the the um, the situation is fluid enough that I don't want to assign a specific number to it yet. Um, but what I will say is that. Um, 
uh, they also, uh, Democrats also um, have picked up at least two seats um, in North Carolina, which are uh, is a, uh, related to um, a redrawing of North Carolina's line, uh, district lines. Um, so we'll, we'll see where, where things land eventually. But um, several of the, the seats that, that Democrats um, uh, did lose um, uh, in the election in the House um, are held by freshmen who had picked up those seats in, in 2018. So I want to talk about that group of um, folks for a second. So in 2018, there were 41 um, seats that flipped from being um, controlled by Republicans to being controlled by Democrats. Um, of those um, 41 seats, where we are right now is that 19 um, of, those, um, of those races, uh, the Democrat was reelected. In six of them, the Democrat has lost. And then in... Um, uh, in nine, uh, the Democrat is trailing, and in seven, the Democrat is leading. So kind of wherever we land, this is going to be a little bit of a, of a mixed bag. Um, we'll need to see more of what happened with the presidential vote in each of these districts to have, I think, a really a much clearer sense um, on what I'm about to say. But one thing I will be watching is that it's entirely possible that what we're seeing in these races is the continued decline of ticket splitting. So when we look at kind of the history of congressional elections um, in the post-war era in the United States, the number of voters who go to the polls and vote for a House candidate of one party and a, a presidential candidate of the other party um, has declined and continues to be at, um, at very low levels. Um, there are two Democratic losses in South Florida, for example, um, that uh, I think reflect this trend uh, when Camille was talking before about um, Trump's um, uh, strength in South Florida. So the idea, um, or sort of what I'll be watching to see if, if the data bears this out, is that the notion that lots of voters uh, went to the polls yesterday, voted for Donald Trump, and then voted for a Republican congressional candidate in districts that um, the Democrats had picked up in, um, in 2018. And I think um, as we learn, again, more about um, the electorate uh, in, in the 2020 election, one important trend that I'll be looking for um, in, these, in these House races is whether this dynamic of um, Democrats having picked up seats in the midterms and then having lost them um, in, uh, in the presidential year is um, uh, a consequence of the increasing um, uh, education polarization between the two parties. So one thing that we've seen um, over the past um, decade plus um, was true uh, it was kind of moving before Trump, um, has continued moving under uh, under Trump, is the movement of um, white voters with college degrees towards the Democratic Party and white voters without college degrees away from the Democratic Party and towards the Republican Party. And that's a shift. Um, we historically um, voter, better educated voters um, were more likely to vote for Republican and simply to turn out to vote. So, um, and, and we know that presidential years turn out more voters than midterm years. So when you kind of put all these pieces together, one possible story, again, like we'll have to wait for the data to know whether this is um, a, a big driver of what we saw, but is the, is the idea that as, um, as Democrats have um, uh, become uh, a party uh, that has more high education, uh, more college educated voters, those folks um, are more likely to turn out all the time. Um, and then Republican um, voters, uh, uh, the Republican party has more voters who are uh, white voters without college degrees who are less likely to turn out all the time and thus maybe only drawn out in presidential years, that that could be producing some of the, the dynamic where Democrats um, fared well in the 2018 midterms because they, they turned out these high education voters who voted for Democratic congressional candidates. And then in some of the same districts when there were more um, uh, voters without college degrees, um, uh, they were more likely to vote for the Republican candidate and for and for Trump. So we'll have to watch, um, uh, analyze the data, but that's that's one possibility that that helps contextualize what what we saw in the House. Um, the other thing I'll say that that um, is interesting to um, uh, will be interesting to to watch now and um, when the new Congress actually begins in January is that. Um, of the Republicans who picked up seats um, from Democrats, we actually, a, a, um, a, a large number of these candidates are women, um, they are minorities, um, and they are veterans. So as we think about the future of the Republican Party, um, uh, either four more years um, with President Trump, depending on how the, um, the presidential race shakes out, or after Trump, this notion that um, we are actually, in, at least in that, the House Republican Conference, seeing some interesting um, uh, uh, some interesting diversity uh, is, is important to keep watching. Um, on, on the Senate, um, 
My point about um, ticket splitting, I think also holds for what we've seen um, in the Senate is so there are some states that um, where Democrats, I think, thought the Senate seats might have been um, winnable, um, but that were in states that that Trump um, was polling well in, um, was uh, perhaps likely uh, to uh, to win, where it was going to be really difficult to break that linkage between the presidential vote and the Senate vote. So here I'm thinking of places like Iowa, of Montana, um, uh, quite possibly North Carolina, depending on how things get finalized there. Um, and in this, in Senate races, similarly, we see this really strong movement away from, from ticket splitting. Um, the, the one kind of glaring exception to all of this, um, which I think importantly maybe helps prove the rule, um, is Susan Collins in Maine, um, where she stands to be, um, I believe, um, uh, at least so f certainly so far um, this year, the only, um, uh, uh, so far the only, a state where a, a Senate candidate of one party, um, uh, a Senate race was won by a candidate of one party where um, the state's electoral votes um, in Maine's case, three of its four went for a presidential candidate of the other party. Um, and I think what this reflects, and there's some other, other data that I'll mention in, in a moment, is that to the extent that we do still see some ticket splitting, again, at much lower levels than historically, um, it is often um, uh, in kind of anticipation of um, wanting to provide, voters wanting to provide a, a check on a president of the other party. And it happens when voters are quite sure that the president of the other party is going to win. So um, there's a political scientist named Bob Erickson who refers to this as anticipatory balancing. So the idea, and, and there's um, evidence to support this for presidential elections in the 20th century, um, post-war elections through, through 2012, which is that basically when um, voters, particularly high information voters, voters who pay a lot of attention to politics, think that a Democratic president is going to win the White House, um, they ticket split more uh, down ballot because they want to provide a, a Republican check in Congress on that, um, on that Democratic president. And um, I, I think that could help explain what we saw in Maine. Um, I think it also helps explain, um, so in, in Colorado, for example, while well, Colorado was won um, pretty handily by both Biden and by John Hickenlooper in a, in a pickup for Democrats, um, Biden ran ahead, or at least presently is running ahead of Hickenlooper. Um, Biden also ran ahead of um, uh, MJ Hagar, the um, Senate candidate in the Democratic Senate candidate in Texas. So um, the idea that there, there are some people in Texas who went to the polls, voted for Biden, and then um, probably also voted for, um, for John Cornyn. As we look at what's happening in, um, in Michigan, I think we could see Biden um, perform better than Gary Peters, um, the Democratic um, Senator there. So this idea that um, to the extent that we are seeing some divergence between the presidential race and some Senate races, um, not so much in the outcomes, but in the, in the margins, that it may be because, again, some of these voters, particularly politically engaged voters, are looking at the, the situation, looking at their expectations of a Biden victory and saying, I'm going to vote for Biden, but I'm also going to vote for a Republican um, down ballot to, uh, to write a check on that um, in the White House. Um, so I'm just going to say briefly. Can I just of, ask yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to talk oh, a little no, bit I about- I just wanted to ask- Yeah, uh, go ahead, you continue. I was going to simply ask the question, could it have just been that there were Republicans out there who just didn't like President Trump? So that's certainly possible as well. Um, uh, maybe... And then went back to their party. In other words, that they weren't making a calculation, they just would normally vote Republican, but just couldn't vote for Trump. So that that's um, that's possible. Um, I mean, I, I I'll remind us all of something that I said a lot after the 2016 election, which and I um, expect that this will be borne out in in this election as well. That most of what happened in 2016 um, is that. Uh, Republicans voted for Trump because he was the Republican nominee and yeah. Democrats voted for Clinton because she was yes. the Democratic nominee. And again, I expect that to, when we when we get data on kind of- 93% like, of Republicans in the exit poll voted for Donald Trump, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think that that's, um, that that's most of it. But again, that lots of, to the extent we still see some tickets splitting, different explanations, but I do think in some of these key races, um, the kind of wide expectation of a Biden victory may have filtered down and led some, some voters to split their tickets. Um, the last thing that I'll say is kind of what happens. Um, it's, it's hard to say, but a couple things to keep an eye on. So um, EJ did mention um, that at least one of Georgia's Senate races looks to be headed for a runoff, which will happen the first week in January. That is the um, a runoff for 
the um, special election in, in Georgia, um, and that'll be between um, uh, Kelly Leffler, who is currently appointed to hold that seat, um, and Raphael Warnock, um, a Democrat, uh, who is a, um, a pastor of a prominent um, uh, African-American church in, uh, in Atlanta. Um, so that that is headed for the runoff, depending on how the final vote count shakes out um, there. It is possible that Georgia's other Senate race um, between David Perdue and John Ossoff could also go to a runoff. Um, Purdue, uh, last I checked before we started, is still above the 50% mark. Um, but I think that the, the uh, Democrats' chances for um, getting to a 50-50 tie in the Senate um, if Biden uh, does win the presidential race are um, are increasingly narrowing. Um, there, there's still there's still a path, but um, it's it's much harder to see than it was 24 hours ago. Um, and so, what would that mean? Um, kind of a narrow Republican majority in the Senate, a Democratic majority in the House, um, and a uh, Democratic president in, in the White House. Um, I think it's not necessarily a recipe for um, certainly for uh, robust legislating on uh, the agenda on which Joe Biden ran. Um, I it's it's hard um, it's hard to sort of map out exactly what things they would take up. Um, I think a, a solid um, indicator early on of how that relationship between a narrow Republican majority in the Senate and Joe Biden in the White House would proceed will be to see how um, a Republican controlled Senate handles um, Biden's uh, prospective President Biden's cabinet nominees. Um, do they do they kind of um, uh, uh, do they confirm them? Do they simply not bring some of them to the floor? What does that all look like? Um, that's a very, that's something I'll be watching closely if that is what comes to pass um, in, uh, in 2021. 20, uh, and then in, in the House, um, you've started to see some sort of reporting on um, whether there's going to be um, sort of uh, 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 disarray or arguments within the House Democratic Caucus about the fact that folks went into the election with a set of expectations that were not met. You've even seen some questions about whether um, someone will challenge Nancy Pelosi for speaker. Um, my, my take on that is that um, if, if you can identify a um, credible alternative, then we can start to talk about whether um, she would be vulnerable to a, to a challenge. Um, I, don't, I don't know who that would be at this point, um, those the the kind of conversation around House Democratic leadership elections will unfold over the next couple of weeks. Um, so just sort of pay attention to that and kind of where the where the House Democratic Caucus kind of lands um, and and where it where it finds itself. And some of that I think will be affected by how um, some of these races that um, are still uh, haven't been called yet um, uh, shake out. Um, and just you know, are there um, are there some of those um, folks who um, who end up winning um, in a way that kind of tamps down a little bit of um, internal unrest if it's if it's there in the in the House um, Democratic uh, Caucus. But um, we'll uh, we'll I'll be paying attention to this um, and uh, we'll see where things go. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, just two pieces of news: uh, the AP and I guess the New York Times has called Wisconsin for Biden. Um, so that's another take, that's another pickup if it holds, but it's very close there. I was saying, just looking at the numbers on the second runoff in Georgia, um, Senator Purdue was at 50.6%, um, which means that if there actually are a lot of missing votes from uh, DeKalb and Fulton counties, that he might just be pushed slightly under. So you, uh, for yeah, political I, judge. Yeah, I'm those sorry? votes. I just that yeah the the idea that there are votes remaining to be counted. Um, I don't like to call them missing because we know where they are. Yes, yes, thank you very much. I, I meant them that. entirely. Um, and and uh, I, I was uh, trying to be innocent about my missing. No, yes, uncounted votes. Thank you very much for that. Um, um, but yes, they could depending on how they would break. That would be what would um, lead Purdue to fall under that fifty percent yeah, mark. But we'll should, just have to uh, see what happens. Armageddon in Georgia it would be a really an amazing uh, January. I'd and just, I would I would would remind all of us that there would be a very strong sense of deja vu because that is how we began uh, 2017, which is with a special election in suburban Atlanta featuring John Ossoff. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me, um, there are, here's what I'd like to do. I wanna toss a bunch of questions out and have each of you decide 
um, uh, this is almost Hayekian of me, which is odd since I'm not a Hayekian, but leaving free, free people free to pick the questions um, they want. Um, because I would like um, uh, Elaine to talk a bit about um, what it would be like without Donald Trump. Is there a chance of the Republican Party changing? How would that change the nature of things? Um, I would like um, uh, Camille. Um, I, 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 yeah, I would. I'd like. I'd like John Udak uh, to talk about the uh, referenda, and perhaps uh, Camille and John to talk about how bad were the polls, um, and or were they as bad, or did people simply read them the way they wanted to read them more than the, what the polls um, actually said, um, and the. Um, um, there were questions about how a, how a, um, um, how a recount uh, would work. Um, there are uh, questions about, um, uh, here's one we can answer. Um, uh, oh, where, there was a question about the Obama-Trump voters and where they went. I don't think we know that entirely yet, but, um, um, and then what happens with the electors? Um, you know, if, the, if, if you get 270 electors, um, for Biden, you could have just a wild time in the Electoral College uh, for the first time. That was uh, one question. Lastly, somebody asked, would the gap between Trump and uh, Biden be bigger or smaller than the gap with Clinton? I think it will be bigger based on what we know right now, uh, because Biden has already hit roughly the gap that Clinton was at, and it looks like it's going to grow. So that's the one question I'll answer. Um, so, uh, uh, Camille, do you want to start picking on any of those or taking it where you wanted to briefly? And then I want to just go around the horn. We've got about 14 minutes. And one last thing, if anybody wants to toss a question in before we close, it is events at Brookings.edu or Twitter at hashtag election 2020. Let me start with Camille. I'll go on my screen. Camille, John, uh, Elaine and uh, Molly. Well, this is great. Thanks, EJ. And um, we've gotten some really fantastic questions. So I think this is going to be a, a lot of fun. Um, I'm just going to answer. There was a really quick question about um, the mention of the, of the about the Venezuelan vote in Miami. Any significant impact? I would say no. Um, primarily, your main Latino voting blocks in in the um, Miami slash Florida area are uh, uh, Cuban Americans and Puerto Ricans. Those are the big ones. Um, and uh, Venezuelans are, you know. They're there, but they're not as significant. So if you're talking about courting Latino votes in Florida and in Miami, you are talking about um, Puerto Ricans and Cubans. Um, so, but Cubans, Cubans um, far, uh, you know, um, there, there's a far greater number of Cubans uh, in Miami-Dade than, than Puerto Ricans. Puerto Ricans tend to concentrate mostly in Central Florida. Um, so also talk, want to talk about polls and I hope um, John will unmute so we can do this together. Um, <laughs> But my sense of the polls is, you know, polls always tighten up, right? A little bit. Um, there's always a margin of error. Uh, so you, you expect some tightening. Um, I think this may be, uh, you know, this may be very similar to what we saw last time. To me, one of the big, the, one of the big differences is, I think that um, it's hard for, poller, for pollsters to get an accurate read on how people, face racial issues. And if I had to pinpoint sort of one issue that I think people were a little bit less than honest about, um, I would say it's, you know, it's national conversation around race. And I do think that that national conversation around race brought out a lot of people who were going, you know, going to vote for Trump, but didn't, didn't say it because they weren't necessarily galvanized on the issue of the economy or the issue of coronavirus. Um, so that's my take, but you know, John, you probably have a lot more to say on that. Yeah, I, I agree with you um, completely, Camille. It's a galvanizing issue. We've known for decades um, what happens when pollsters ask voters or prospective voters issues that are uh, specifically about race or um, deal with uh, race, the race of a candidate, et cetera. And, and that can create some real complications. Um, in terms of, you know, we've all heard the question and we're gonna get asked it a million more times, uh, why were the polls so wrong? Um, I'll push back a bit on that. Um, I think the national poll is probably, the, you know, the national polling average 
is probably going to be, um, you know, within the margin of error of where this ends up being, which is probably Biden winning the popular vote by, you know, three, four uh, percent. The average of polls um, leading up to the election was, you know, five, six percent for Biden around there. Um, I think they performed well. Uh, again, at the state level, most of these swing state polls were within the margin of error. Now, they were all, uh, with the exception of Ohio and, and Florida, they were all breaking toward Biden. Um, but most of them were one, two, three, four, five percent uh, margins. And so it's important to note that margins of error are a real thing. Um, and we need to recognize that when we're, we're looking at polls. Um, uh, you know, polling isn't a, lo a lost cause. Um, they were really uh, performing well in 2018. Um, and uh, this year, I think if we take a breath, wait for the results to come in and take a look, um, it's going to tell us that they were generally fairly accurate within a margin of error. But I will say this. Um, what happened in 2016 was that the polls were largely breaking toward Clinton within the margin of error, and Trump did better than than all of them. It was sort of the on Trump side of the margin of error. The same seemed to be happening in a lot of places um, this year, Trump overperforming the polls. So it raises the question, what is it when Donald Trump is on the ballot that underestimates support for him? Um, and it's a serious question at the national level. It's a serious question at the state level. It's not a problem with polling per se. It's not a, a problem with the science of polling. It's, I think, a problem around how we are able to build likely voter models when Donald Trump is on the ticket. And I think pollsters, like after every election, are going to go back and take a look and see what they did right and see what they did wrong. But there is this Trump effect that I think is confounding, and it's going to uh, inform pollsters moving forward, not just about how to deal with the person who's on the top of the ticket, um, but to deal with the, the voters who are supporting that person. Could I just say one quick thing on that, that it struck me that the states where the polls were very close going in, like Florida, did not go to Biden, um, you know, and that you, that was not a given that he was going to carry uh, Florida. The states where he had a bigger lead, which would be the Midwestern states plus Pennsylvania and Arizona. Uh, uh, and Arizona and Nevada seem to have gone to Biden, though not by the margins anticipated. Is that fair? Or... Yeah, and, and, and but I think that in that entirety is the, is consistent with this break toward Trump, right? So something is happening in the polls in places like Wisconsin, uh, in places like uh, Arizona, um, Michigan. Uh, that lead for Biden was much more comfortable, in most cases still within the margin of error, but much more comfortable. And that break toward Trump just wasn't big enough to pull Biden down, but it could have been, right? I mean, we, we could be talking, you know, give or take another 100,000 votes here or there, we could be talking about a significant Trump victory too. And so something is happening systematically within polls when it comes to Trump being on the ticket. Um, Elaine, do you want to take any of these, including the electoral, uh, uh, the electoral college, uh, the future, the litigation we're likely to see? Some people uh, wanted to uh, ask about, um, and um, uh, how would a how would a recount work? A any of the anything in that uh, bucket, Elaine, is yours. Okay. Well, there are. Uh, let's take the the straightforward ones first. The the um, Procedures for recounts are well established in state law in all states. So it's not, they're not going to make this up as they go along. There will probably be a recount, it looks like, in Wisconsin, and uh, that will take some time, but it will be done in a timely manner. As for the Electoral College, states generally have statutes, and the statutes say that the certified winner of the state is the one whose electors get to go to the state capitol and sign what's called in a very old fashioned term, the certificate of ascertainment, which gets sent to the Senate. So there is a, there, there, are, there are state laws that govern the electors and they've been litigated over the years. There's been court cases on this, et cetera. Um, the notion that I think has been around either uh, 
paranoid by Democrats or trying to cause, cause trouble um, by others is the, the notion that the, uh, a state legislature can just willy nilly switch the electors. It's a little bit hard to do because there are many um, state statutes that govern it. Um, but let me go to one of the early things you mentioned, DJ, which is the future of the Republicans and what does yeah. the world look like without Trump? Um, assuming that Joe Biden gets his 270 electoral votes, maybe more, um, by the time the week is over. And, and I, would I think we're going to know by the time the week is over with some certainty. Um, what does it look like? Well, the, the depressing thing about these election results was just how big and how wide the gap is in this country between uh, the Trump voters the, and, the, and the Democrats. Um, but on the, on the flip side of that is if you think about the last four years, the single person who has most contributed to polarization is the president himself. And so many things that he said, the, the calling his opponents names, the, the lies, the, the racist dog whistles, all these things he has exacerbated exacerbated divisions that already were in America. But we never had a president exacerbating those, right? We, we had presidents who tried to uh, speak to everybody, uh, whether they were Democrats or Republicans. So we've had a very, very unique president. If Trump is defeated, if he leaves office, which I think he will, um, if he's defeated, um, I think that we will see a lessening of this polarization for one simple fact. The president of the United States will not be fanning the flames. And I feel sort of sorry for the press because for the press for the last four years has been in this bind. They know that many of the things Trump has been saying don't make sense, are, are outright untruths, whatever. And yet he is the president they have to follow him. That is not the case for Donald Trump, private citizen. And there doesn't look, while there are people in the Republican party who share the president's um, philosophy, I don't see anybody up and coming behind him who are likely to be as talented, shall we say, at stirring the pot as only Donald Trump can be. So I'm, uh, EJ, like, like you, I'm, I'm sort of an optimist rather than a pessimist. And I actually see that even though the divisions in this election are deep, I think uh, the removal of Trump from the scene will actually help to smooth over some of those divisions. Thank you. Um, I'm, you know what, funny, I am an optimist like you are. On that one, I, I am struck by something a conservative friend told me a couple of days ago which is every Republican politician will be aware that the vast majority of the party voted for Donald Trump. And so even though he is someone who would like to reform the party, um, he is not as optimistic that there will be a quick pull away from Trumpism. But I think there's no question that not having a period of what I like to call glorious tranquility would uh, <laughs> might make a difference here. And it's on that, by the way, someone asked uh, how did independents vote according to the exit poll, People who checked the independent or something else box voted 50, voted 54, 40 uh, for Biden. Um, and DJ, he, I have just one thing to follow up on Elaine's point about. Sort oh, of, please do. Uh, that's where I was going to push you anyway. Um, Republicans after there, Trump. So I think that one, uh, one thing to keep in mind um, if Trump does lose and we are thinking about what governing with a Democratic president, a smaller Democratic majority in the House, and the current Republican um, majority in the Senate is that um, a non-trivial number of the Republicans in the Senate would like themselves to run for president in 2024. And so, um, um, again, if, uh, frankly, either if uh, Trump wins or loses. Um, and so the um, what that means for how they conduct themselves within the conference, I think is important. Um, when it looked more like Democrats would take a majority in the Senate, um, I had been saying that this was going to take the form of um, 
a sort of very strident return to uh, anti-deficit and debt politics, and we can't spend money, we can't spend more on COVID relief, so on and so forth. Um, I think there's still a possibility of that um, going forward that we'll see some of these um, these folks. But to to the point you just made, EJ, about um, Republicans knowing that the people who elected Donald Trump also elected them is really, I think, going to be affecting how some of these, um, how kind of the Tom Cottons and the Josh Hawleys of the world who would like to run for president um, conduct themselves um, in the Republican uh, the conference in the Senate. Yeah, in fact, depending on the outcome of this election, if there is a post-Trump Republican debate, I'm hoping we can all reconvene and just uh, with some friends on the right to discuss the many possible philosophical factions uh, that we might see in that party. And I'm grateful for your description of the United States Senate. In some ways, the definition of a senator is someone who thinks that he or she would make a better president than all the other people they work with every day. Uh, it's amazing how many would-be presidents are in that uh, group. Um, let me just, uh, 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 Camille has to run off to a meeting, so if it makes it easier I want to give you a chance to jump in if there's anything that's inspired you to comment before you go. I want to answer a question and just see if anyone has closing comments. Do you have um, do you have a last thought to share with I, us? I don't. I don't have a last thought except that I um, I'm very very hopeful that uh, however the election turns out, everyone will have learned a very important uh, civics lesson um, that hopefully will stick with us uh, as we go through you know 2024 and beyond. Bless you for that. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I want to answer very quickly, and Godspeed. Uh, I wanted to answer very quickly a question. Has anybody, uh, have, has a recount ever flipped results? Very rarely. This is a pretty big margin. I guess my worry about this recount is that the Trump campaign won't simply try to recount the ballots. They may go in to try to challenge the legitimacy of a lot of ballots. If they go down that road, we will be in for a real mess. I hope they don't go there. Uh, but you know, uh, there's no sense that they wouldn't. Uh, I just want to ask all three of you, um, we need to shut down. A, a, something that you think we will take away or that you're going to likely think about five years from now about this election, uh, just a principal takeaway. Um, um, besides, by the way, passing marijuana uh, in four states, which we never got to passing the minimum wage in Florida, even as it was going for Donald Trump, as John mentioned before we started, we never got there. Just uh, each of you a quick takeaway uh, before we go. You know, I'll, I'll start with that, EJ. I was really struck, as I was four years ago, but this time again, at the enormity of the urban-rural divide in this country. I mean, as those counties were coming in and we were watching um, Florida and, and Pennsylvania and Michigan so carefully, um, there's a big difference in the worldview between urban and rural. And, uh, you know, if Biden becomes the president, he is um, certainly running. He certainly ran as a uniter. I'm hoping that he will be able to kind of begin to bridge that gap. It's a disturbing, it's a disturbing difference. And it's backed up by some hostility, a lot of misunderstanding. And I, I think that that's something we really need to work on. Thank you. Um, I'll go quickly, EJ. I'll, I'll do both a, a takeaway, um, but also very quickly, um, you know, Barack Obama said we're not a red America or a blue America, we're the United States of America. I think last night showed us we're not a red America or a blue America, we're, we're a green America. Um, the marijuana legalization ballot initiatives were in five states, four for adult use and one for um, medical. In five of the most divergent states uh, you could imagine, Arizona, Montana, New Jersey, South Dakota, and Mississippi. Um, they passed overwhelmingly um, in, in each of those states. And the, the people who are working on those campaigns uh, put in a lot of hard work over the past uh, several months uh, and, and really years and, and found uh, a remarkable success in all corners of the United States. And I, I think it shows uh, some unity in this country around an issue. Um, and, and there's a lot of unity around sets of issues in this country that I think a close presidential race like this often glosses over. Um, that we might be divided about the president, um, but on, on specific issues, we can you know hold hands, play nice uh, and come together. That said, the sort of takeaway for me 
um, from uh, last night and what we might be talking about in five years. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard from a lot of Democratic friends over the past weeks and months um, that they saw the 2016 election as America making a mistake. Um, but America didn't make a mistake in 2016. It, it didn't, or it, rather it felt like it didn't make one last night. Um, it looked at Donald Trump after four years in office and 66 million Americans went back to the polls and said, yes, I would like him to continue to be our president. Um, what motivates individuals to vote for Donald Trump is something fundamental in our politics. It is not something that in our politics people are willing to say was a mistake or believe was a mistake. There are tens of millions of Americans who are happy to sign up um, for the types of policies and leadership that Donald Trump exhibits. And I think Democrats who write that off as a fluke do so at their own peril. Yeah, I think Holly. that's a good segue into what my biggest takeaway is, which is just frankly how stable this race was the whole time <laughs> that if you look at kind of the, um, the approval ratings of both candidates, of um, the vote intention for both candidates. They're, given all of the things that have happened since the beginning of 2020, um, that, you know, they are, we are where we are, we were in January. Um, and we are in the middle of a global pandemic and we impeached the president in that time. And we are basically where we were at the beginning. And so to, just to John's point is that, um, their, um, the, the current moment um, for all of its kind of day-to-day -day chaos um, has a lot of partisan stability of voters into two increasingly well-sorted partisan teams. Um, and that's where kind of where we are. Um, and as we think about where we're going, I think we should keep that in mind. Thank you so much. I want to thank the absent Camille. I want to thank Elaine and John and Molly. Uh, and that's a really powerful point to end on, uh, Molly. Um, if you look at the polling averages, Joe Biden was ahead of Donald Trump in September of 2019 uh, by a few points. And he ended up on election day in November of 2020 ahead of Donald Trump by a few points. Uh, and so um, I don't know what that tells us about the campaign and its effect. I don't even know what that tells us about COVID uh, and its effect. It may tell you that people had made up their mind on Donald Trump a long time uh, ago. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you everyone out there uh, for uh, listening. And uh, uh, please join us again because we're gonna be exploring uh, the, uh, the next term of the, the first term of the new president or what happens uh, if things go uh, the other way uh, for some time to come. And we're also going to be exploring election reform and a lot of other issues at Brookings. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.